And we now have our scripture lesson that will be shared by Tom Schaefer. It comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. And that will be followed by our anthem, by our sanctuary singers, and accompanied by Nara Lee. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I have said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? That's the end of the reading. 
Thank you, Tom, and thank you, singers, for that really, really great anthem. I'm not sure when you're watching this. Uh, you know that if you were part of our Sunday morning crowd that we had an interruption of service. We now heard from AT&T that this is going to take a few hours, so we may be coming to you Sunday night or Monday sometime, but we're glad we're able to, to do it this way. I know that in my explanation of it, someone may go, okay, Boomer, because they're young enough that they know my explanations of the technology of this are not especially great. And I am a, a baby Boomer. I own it fully. Uh, Mary Beth in the children's moment brought out the phone with the buttons and said she remembered having a phone that dials. I remember having a phone in which she just picked up the phone and said, and the operator would say, number please. I remember vinyl recordings before they were vintage. I remember uh, A-track players, which I don't ever see anymore. And <clears throat> I just know that there are many times in which um, I would see cartoons with Dick Tracy, who had basically an Apple Watch on his hand when I was growing up, when we didn't believe that was even a possibility. And look where we are. But what I'm especially glad about is that while we have recordings of this service, there were not recordings of my first sermons. I think they would be dangerous to watch. Uh, dangerous for you and certainly dangerous for me. But I do remember that first sermon. I remember it arose from the passage that Tom Schaefer read for us, this conversation of Jesus and Nicodemus. Jesus, the young rabbi, Nicodemus, this, the wise and older uh, religious leader. And in that sermon in my early days in my Southern Baptist church, I talked a lot about what it meant to be born again, that there was this crisis experience you went through when you accepted Jesus and you were converted in that moment. And, you know, a lot of truth, I'm sure, in, in, in that sermon that I preached, but the irony was I did not have a time when I look back, could look back and say, that's when I became a Christian. I was just loved into the faith by my family, but I couldn't talk about that because in our church you were supposed to have a story of this dramatic moment, and I didn't have it. I also didn't realize that at the time that the new birth, the being born again that Jesus talked about with Nicodemus was only one image one metaphor that could describe entry into Christian faith, that there were so many others, that, that Jesus was the water, that he would give you water, that you'd never be thirsty again, that Jesus was the bread of life, that Jesus was the one who would be the light of the world, that Jesus would be the one who would wash the feet of disciples. So many images that are so powerful. Second sermon I preached um, was about 20 years later, about 20 years ago, as a matter of fact. And I talked about, in that sermon, my grandparents' home. They lived right down the street from me. I stayed there during the day while my parents were at work. And they had a front porch, a screened-in porch. If you've been in the South, you've no doubt seen them. And it was the place where they would receive friends. They would sit in their rocking chairs or on the porch swing. They would drink iced tea on a hot day and eat um, uh, pecan tassies that my grandmother had made from the pecans that fell on the trees you were watching as you sat in those rocking chairs. Very light very playful, very welcoming. But they had another part of their house they called the back porch. It was, it used to be a porch, but they had enclosed it so it became like a, a sitting room. And that's where they spent most of their time. And it was in that room, in the back porch, where some really challenging conversations happened. I would see my grandfather talk to some of our pastors. He loved them all, but he would disagree with them and he would not hide his discontent and he would name it. I would see my grandfather try to process when he would hear members of our church who would say they did not like, even sometimes hated people of other races. And he would go, how can they be Christian and do that? I remember my grandfather quoted scripture all the time. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Before I ever read that, I could quote it because he would say it every other day. And it was in that room that I knew that hard things happened. And I said in that sermon 20 years ago that the conversation with Nicodemus was not a front porch conversation. It was a back porch conversation where you talked about really, really challenging stuff that opened up into life. And I think that that was the kind of conversation Jesus had with Nicodemus and that we were invited and called and expected to have. And then there's this sermon, the third one, the one I'm preaching right now in which I am from my 66-year-old perch looking back at Nicodemus and Jesus chatting, recognizing Jesus is this young upstart rabbi who has these new ideas, who's making a name for himself. And Nicodemus comes to him and says, you know, we know you're really a God. You're doing some really great things. But as Jesus says some things to Nicodemus, he including about being born again, Nicodemus goes, I don't get this. And Jesus says, you're a teacher of Israel. And both implying he should be able to look into his reservoir of wisdom and get it. And yet, he is not. 
So there is this sense in which the script is flipped because the traditional path in the, in the Hebrew scriptures and in much of life and much of the world is that the older teach the younger. The wise, aged, seasoned mentor imparts wisdom to the trainee, to the mentee, to the younger one. And in this sermon, in this, in this story, there is Jesus talking to the older one saying, you, he didn't say it like this, old man have to experience a new beginning, a new birth, and understanding why Nicodemus might have been flummoxed at that whole notion. And then there is this other thing where Nicodemus says, the scripture says he came to him at night. Some people have wondered, did he come to him at night because he was afraid and didn't want his enemies to see that he was talking to Jesus? Or maybe he came to him at night because that was the time where you really sat around and studied the law in detail with deep meditation. Where Barbara Brown Taylor says that it is really great for us to understand that we don't just walk in the light, but we walk in the sacred dark. And Nicodemus maybe came to Jesus for enlightenment, but what he got was in darkenment, the sense that there was not the easy answer and that he would have to enter into the depth of the hard questions. And that's why this passage probably is somewhat, one of the reasons it's probably troubling to me. Because I'm 66, I probably have more questions now than I've ever had in all of my life. And I'm not entirely sure what to do about that. So one of the things I did <clears throat> this week, uh, called some about 10 people together that spanned the generations. You know the generations. Uh, the, the, they're listed in those who study generations as the greatest generation, born 1901. The silent generation, born 1928. Baby boomers, born 1946. Generation X, born in 65 and later. Millennials born 1981 and later. Generation Z born 1998 and later. And then the last one, Generation Alpha, born 2011 and later. They say we all have some differences, different ways of processing things. So I've called some leaders that some of you know in this church, some of them that um, I don't think you know, but they are really all incredible people. And I could have done a hundred more, uh, but they all came on Monday night to a Zoom call. And I asked them these questions and I let them talk. And here's some of the things I glean. One of them said that while gener some of them said while, that while the generational reflections are important, it's not the only thing. That we have to learn, learn, look at intersectionality, that where is intersectionality, where, where we, these things bump into our whole being, our race, our gender, sexual orientation and gender identity, our uh, religious experience, our countries of origin, our, our regions of origin, and so many more things Temperamental differences bump in together that make us who we are. And they also said that one of them, several, several of them said that they had discovered that sometimes people of widely differing generations could work better and more creatively than people of the same generation. And one of the things I mentioned in, at the, toward the end that still leaves me mm, disheartened is that in this millennial generation, this very young generation, the numbers of people who are unaffiliated with traditional religious groups is widening and deepening. I don't take that to mean that there is not a spiritual hunger there. I do take it to mean that maybe we, institutional church, it's not just the main lines, but institutional church are not scratching people where they itch and are not opening up to the great wealth of the wisdom of God. So this is where I am. I think I identify with Nicodemus, and I think he would look at me and say, you're nothing like me. And I, I, I admit, there's so many ways in which I'm not like Nicodemus, but, but I am at this place where I think I'm hearing the Spirit say, there are some things that you need to do differently. There are some questions, some hard questions that you and people like you need to be able to ask. So. I mean, I have these, this sense right now. I, I, I've said before, I think I said in a sermon, maybe it was in one of our classes, and this is not going to sound very generous uh, to my colleagues, but I don't like whiny preacher articles in which preachers collect and talk about how hard it is for us. It's hard for everyone. And yet, having said that, I will tell you this has been a really hard year. I mean, are you not weary of this pandemic with its cost to health? with its cost to our ability to socialize, our ability to, to develop and, and play with all of our gifts. Are we not tired, sick and tired, 
of hearing about shootings. And it's, surely there's a proliferation of guns, which is a problem, another one last night. Also, there's not enough mental health. It's, it's a shame and it's heartbreaking that it's easier to get an automatic weapon than it is to get treatment for mental health. Does that not weigh on you that our uh, Asian friends, our Pacific Islander friends, that our African American friends are so frequently having to face this repeated story of someone being killed for no reason? That the challenge we have of communicating with, with each other without breaking into ridiculous name calling. Yeah, I'm tired. And it's different than the faith crisis I used to have. The faith crisis I had when I was in my early 20s especially was one in which I wasn't sure about God's existence. I wasn't sure about the inspiration of scriptures. I wasn't sure about how to talk about Jesus. The faith crisis I'm having right now is I'm not sure that we're making a dent in the things I've talked about. And that concerns me. And it has me looking in new directions. So a memory came to me this week. Uh, the first seminary I attended was more than conservative, it was fundamentalist. And I'm talking about short sleeve, white shirts, necktie, close cropped hair, brill cream, fundamentalist. You know what I'm talking, if you don't know what I'm talking about, that's fine. Uh, where I hear my colleagues, students asking professors, what do we believe about that? Even then I knew that was the wrong question to ask. But, but the grace of those years to me was a man I've talked about before named Reginald Barnard, a man from Australia who studied theology in England and in the United States, who probably shouldn't have been at that seminary. Um, but he was deep, he was poetic, he was profound, he was of deep faith. And I remember one day in a, in a second story classroom, I was sitting there with about 30, all guys, most of the guys in the seminary. And he looked out off the window and he stared out and he waved his hand and he said, Jesus is real. And all through the room, you could hear, amen, hallelujah. And then he looked at the class and he said, Jesus is real, right, boys? And it got really quiet. The only thing you could hear was the nervous breathing you hear when someone has punctured the dogma that's publicly proclaimed. And in that one question, he made it okay for a person of faith to also be a person with questions and with doubts. And so as I've sat with these questions, these oh, questions that seem so hard to answer and so hard to address, maybe, maybe the place in them where we meet the risen Christ is where the easy amens and alleluias stop and the nervous breathing begins and we have different conversations with different people and explore questions that we don't have any idea how to answer and we abandon what we think we know and listen, listen to what the larger community of every age is saying. Because this is not all about, is not all about generational difference. So I, I heard a TED talk recently by Chip Conley. He was a longtime hotelier in his, he's a baby boomer. But he was asked by the millennial uh, uh, entrepreneurs of the startup Airbnb. You know what that is. It's where you can find a, a bed and breakfast or some other place to stay online. And he said, when I, in my first few meetings with him, he says, I was lost. He said, these millennials were using words and technology. I didn't know what to do. They finally assigned a young woman named Laura to sit by me. And she would translate for me and said, this is what they just said. This is what they just meant. And he said, but what I have noticed is that eventually she would say, you know, you're different. And you talk about a comprehensive vision of who we can be. And we're just starting with where we are and doing this thing that we know to do. And he said, I realized that maybe in our business there, there was room for another kind of elder, not the elder that you treated just with respect, but the elder of any age who could bring real wisdom into real-time problems. And he said, maybe it's time to change the physics for how wisdom flows, that it flows both from the older to the younger and from the younger to the older. And that spoke to me. That spoke to me because I've been around young people lately and I hear them and I try to keep up with them. Sometimes in the meetings we have with some of these young clergy, Mary Beth, I can't keep up. They process so differently and they're so passionate 
and they're so on point. And it leaves me going, at this age, what can I learn so I will still be useful and involved with the Spirit of Christ in the graceful work of changing life, of transforming the world? And so one of the people I listen to when I have those kinds of questions is Reverend Otis Moss III of Trinity Church in Chicago. Um, he's, his grandfather and father before him were pastors, and he connects well with people of, of every generation. And he is uh, probably both a disruptor and a person with wise wisdom that both can be present in the same community, both can be honored in the same community. And he loves to talk about Howard Thurman, and he told this story. Howard Thurman, this great African-American theologian and, and philosopher and teacher of earlier years, he talked about Howard Thurman, a story he told about Howard's grandmother. Howard said, my grandmother was a slave, was freed, and then she had a parcel of land. This parcel of land was right next to land that was owned by a white woman. And the white woman did not like it at all that my grandmother, that Howard said my grandmother owned property. And so every night she would go to her chicken coop and take the chicken manure out and throw it over the fence on the plants that my, his grandmother was raising. He just really didn't like her. He said what my grandmother would do every night, every morning would go out there and wipe the manure off and roll it into the field, into the, into the dirt as fertilizer. He said eventually it came about that this older white woman got really sick, really sick. And he said apparently she wasn't just mean to black people because nobody came to see her. No white people, no black people. But my, mother, my grandmother found out she was sick and she took some of the vegetables that she had made that's grown in the garden and, ray, and made chicken soup. And she took some of the flowers that she had grown from her garden and took them to this woman. And she went to her house and she said, what are you doing here? She said, she said I know you don't feel well. I made you some food. She was too weak to resist. So this grandmother went to this older white woman's room as she lay down on her bed and fed her spoonful by spoonful. And then she, after she was full, she said, that was really delicious. And then she said, do you have some vases? And she said, yeah, they're right over there. She went and got her flowers and brought them in her room. And she said, this woman, older woman, said, those are the most beautiful flowers I've ever seen. <laughs> and he said, my grandmother said, you know you helped raise them, right? She said, how did I do that? She said, because the manure that you threw over the fence, I used to help grow these vegetables that you've eaten, and these flowers that you're admiring. Howard Thurman says he learned from that story to take the ache and the worst of what had happened, to use it to transform the world as God longs for the world to be. And so this is going to sound like a very um, cheap call, if you will, or maybe not very reverent call. But there's a lot of stuff out there right now. We are called to go into the midst of it and use it and all of its stench and not hide from it to make this world blossom with grace and with goodness. And if that's our way of being born again right now, praise God. Amen. That is gospel. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to join as we come together for our closing hymn.
stay together in the space and outside of the space um, about how important it is, not just that we're talking about generations, but what we talk about, not just saying the problem is out there, yeah. but how do we start within ourselves? That some of those who um, sometimes are affected the most by bias and other things are some of the most brave who are um, living in very difficult circumstances, who have come to this place with very little, who um, bravely deal with physical and mental illnesses, yeah. That, yeah. that we start with us, yeah. and that us as, as individuals, and also us as a community. And you know, Mary Beth, we have folks who are listening now who had to adjust because of what happened with our broadcast today, mm -hmm. and that I think that, that we'll have people who'll be adjusting as we move through into this reopening plan. Part of what that tells me is that in these days, we're going to be doing some deep listening and deep learning, and maybe learning a few new dance steps with each other as the Spirit calls us to deal with questions that maybe we haven't picked up in a long time, if ever before. But the good news is we have people all around us of every age who are seasoned and who are brave. And that's the good news for us as God is with us. And, and so we can listen better. We can listen and better. We can listen better. So we leave this time now in peace, praying that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit will be with us all now and forever. Amen. Amen.